if you haven't noticed by now, a lot of these things pertain to the rest of the New Testament. As an example, most of this chapter has to do with the city of Corinth, to which Paul wrote two very, very important letters to that church. And so much, and I don't understand why we, we don't say this more often or we don't believe this more often, but the Bible is not some dead bunch of manuscripts. It is so relevant. I have a book in my, and I don't know why. The only reason I haven't burned it is because I hate to destroy a book. But it talks about the relevancy of Scripture. And the, man, the whole purpose of this book, and it was written in the 40s, is to prove that the Bible no longer is relevant. But what you can't help, if you do anything, we are, we are commanded to study. We are commanded to pray. And it seems like that gets to be more and more of a chore when we get so wrapped up in, oh, the poor me's that are going on. So we neglect praying and we neglect studying because we're so busy con concerning ourselves with whether or not I can go here or there without covering up my face. But the relevancy to this world from this word never should cease to amaze us. Amen. Here it is. We, we, we just saw Paul spending his time, some time in Athens, trying to confront the intellectuals. And probably one of the most disappointing incidents in Paul's journeys was the time he spent at Athens. Because you, you talk about people who say, well, everybody's right. How can, you, how can you even convince somebody of the truth of the gospel when they think, you're right. And then this guy over here is right. He may be totally the opposite, but he's right. So Paul came, and he, just think of it. He went from that setting to the city of Corinth. Corinth was one of the most populous, wealthy cities in Greece. And at the same time, it was one of the most luxurious, pride-filled, and degenerate cities on the planet. Sexual immorality was not only practice, it was allowed. And not only that, it was consecrated in the worship of Diana. A large part of the wealth and splendor of the economy of that city came from offerings made by the unrestrained evil that went on in those temples of that goddess. The temple of Diana, it's the main one, employed over a thousand temple prostitutes. No city in ancient times was more degenerate. It's the center of splendor and show and corruption. And then here, looking at all of that from our standpoint, Paul comes and is going to start a church. And not only did he decide that this was the place God had wanted him to plant a church, but he was eminently successful. But he, you know, you, those two letters that we, letters that we have later, Two letters that we have letter uh, from him to this church were addressing the th you, you can't expect well you can but it was hard in those days to expect people to come out of a culture like that and not drag some of it with them into the church you say pastor bob that can't happen oh come on look around yeah. how much baggage do we drag in from out there into here every time we come to church come and he wrote he had to write this and it shows not only how successful he was by writing those letters but also the extent of the well-known character and tendencies of those people and that had accounted for the admonitions and the, the arguments and things that were in those letters Corinth had been de totally destroyed by the Romans 146 years before Christ, and it later 
Julius Caesar came along and he rebuilt the whole thing, reestablished it, made it a Roman colony, and you don't you know it didn't take very long because it came right back to where it had been before. It regained all of its splendor and relapsed into all of its former degradation. And Paul arrived there approximately A.D. 52, 53, something like that. And this is something that it's been working on me for a while. Paul came there straight, straight from Athens, right? Around 52, 53 A.D. So say 50 to 53 A.D., he was in Athens. Do you realize, and we just did this just last week when we went through Acts 17, that since that day, God will no longer look away from your ignorance. He told those people on the Areopagus, these times of ignorance, God once winked at. He overlooked it. He, he let it go. But from this day, he said, men have to repent. There's no more overlooking ignorance. There's nowhere in your Bible that you can show me where God ever blessed ignorance. Now, I'm talking about the lack of knowledge. I wasn't taught. I don't know that. I didn't know that. We walk around in a society where ignorance of the law is no excuse. One day when we look at God, we're going to say ignorance of the word is no excuse. But from that day forward, I don't know if anybody's ever nailed that down on you yet, but he said... Former times, before this, God winked at ignorance. But from this day, no more. And this is that he went from that setting to this. Just an absolute, outrageously debauched, if you please, city. And when he got there, he found a couple of people, Jewish people with the... With, uh, Roman names. Maybe they had lived so long in Rome before they got ran out that they had just lost the use of their Jewish names or it was safer to not use your Jewish name. I don't know. But originally they came from a place called Pontus in the easternmost part of Asia Minor. There were Jews in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2 and 9 from Pontus. Christians from Pontus were included in Peter's greeting at the strangers in the dispersion. Claudius was the Roman emperor. He started reigning in A.D. 41 until he was poisoned in A.D. 64. <laughs> well, at least those politics were a little bit lighter than ours. No, but anyway, during that time period at 20 plus years, we don't know when he issued the command that kicked all the Jews out of Rome. But apparently somewhere in that time, he got fed up with all of their nonsense. <laughs> Josephus doesn't mention it. He was a Jewish historian. But the Roman historian Suetonius, he, he mentions it and says he expelled the Jews from Rome who were constantly exciting tumults under their leader, Crestus. Obviously, the Roman historian wouldn't have been as well acquainted with Jewish affairs and he very well could have mistaken the name of Christ, made the assumption that he was the leader of those Jews causing all the ruckus. But there's reasons to believe that before they were run out, Christianity had already been brought to Rome by all those people who had been dispersed. And if it was there, you know, just like everywhere else, it would have caused contention with the Jews. And I, these, most of these people in, in those ancient empires have no patience with your nonsense. If you don't, it's my way or you're dead. You know, they got lucky. They got ran out of town. But it's just not going to have it. Don't going to do it. And it's easy for a Roman historian to make a mistake, but they suppose that Jesus was the leader of all this confusion because they were, it was over the contention of whether or not he was the Messiah, plus a whole bunch of other things. But all that matters to me is the fact that Luke and Suetonius both agree that it happened. And it led to where we are in Acts 18, verse 3, 2 and 3, with Aquila and Priscilla 
And so Paul hooked up with them because they were of the same occupation, the same trade, and he worked. He worked at that occupation. He also worked for his own support in Ephesus and again in Thessalonica. But it was a regular custom for Jewish people to train their sons in a trade so that when they grew up, they could take care of themselves. They didn't get to live at home with mom and dad. Maybe we need to, re never mind. <laughs> and it says every Sabbath, Paul was in the synagogue. Every Sabbath. You think this guy wasn't serious about what he was doing? Every Sabbath, he was in the synagogue, and he was in there discussing and arguing and persuading people that Jesus was who he said he was, using their scriptures every Sabbath. And when Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia because he had sent for them in the last chapter, they got there. It says here, Paul was so... He was pressed in the spirit. Does anybody here, I know three or four of you do, know what an iron is? <laughs> that word pressed in the spirit is the same concept that you would do with a hot iron pressed against something to remove the wrinkles. He was under such pressure in his spirit he was so in love with Jesus. He was so convicted that his truth was real and strong. He worked extremely hard to make them understand the truth that Jesus was the Messiah. How hard do we work to convince anybody that Jesus is who we say he is? He was so Press, he had so much pressure, spiritual pressure on him. And he loved Jesus so much that he couldn't not work hard to convince somebody else of that same truth. He, but the thing, he, to the Jews, that's just a horrible scandal. <laughs> it was the worst thing they could ever listen to is this guy who was crucified was our Messiah. And so it says that, they, that in verse 6, when it said they opposed themselves, that, that word means they set themselves in battle array. They, they did the mule thing, planted their hind feet, and they sold up, as the old boy used to say, and they are ready to fight. They opposed him, they resisted him so much that they blasphemed. Did they, when, when, when you are so dead set against the truth, the only option left to you is to blaspheme. That's all they had left. They, had to, they, they, they literally sold themselves to the concept of rebellion. They were so agitated that they went to the point of blasphemy. Now, what did Paul do? Shook his cloak. Walked out. Said, from now on, you're on your own. Not only did he want to let them know that he had nothing else to do with them, but also God had nothing more for them. If you are going to resist God to the point of blasphemy, then God doesn't have any more time for you. He, same as Matthew 10, 14, shaking the dust off your feet. He shook off his cloak and he was at least now temporarily at the point where he was no gone, no longer go to go to synagogues. But Jesus had already pronounced desolation upon them, and here he is just confirming that. He still go later on, you'll see in the next chapter or so of Acts, that he did go back to synagogues, but he effectively said, the guilt of your destruction is on you. You chose can you imagine people standing someday and screaming, I didn't go to hell. He says, you chose. You chose. You had every opportunity to make a choice. You are the only cause of destruction that you can, that's coming upon you 
that there is. He, he said, I've done my duty. The gospel has been offered fairly and deliberately rejected. And he said, I'm not to blame for what's going to happen to you in the future. It's just, and he left. He went from there. He went to a certain man's house named Justice. And he worshiped God. And the house is, of course, next door to the synagogue. <laughs> you know, and so Crispus was the ruler, chief ruler of the synagogue got saved. Ah, and it said along with many other Corinthians who were believed, they were baptized. Crispus is mentioned in 1 Corinthians 1.14 is one of the few that Paul baptized himself. But it, look at how, how galling this must have been to the Jewish community. The, the chief ruler of the synagogue, this guy presided over all the meetings, interpreted the law for them, decided what was lawful and unlawful, he punished, he solemnized marriages, he issued divorces, and he got saved. And so a guy named Sosthenes succeeded him. But according to 1 Corinthians 1.1, he could have also become a convert. <laughs> Along with all of his family and all a bunch of other Corinthians, the power of the gospel was never more impressive than... Converting sinners in Corinth. Establishing a Christian church in a place that was so decadent. If a church operating under the power of biblical truth and the power of the Holy Ghost could be formed there, it can happen anywhere. There is nothing so corrupt that the gospel can't change it and purify it. Then, can you imagine everywhere he goes? Now, I, you could speculate all day long about how old he was when he got saved and how old he was now. And everywhere he went, the Jews are fighting him. Everywhere he went, they're threatening to they find ways to kill him turn him over to the law, get him, you know, executed, do whatever. And in verse 9, middle of the night, can you hear this? Hey, Saul, wake up. <laughs> don't be afraid. You speak what I give you, don't hold back. Just, you know, anybody testify to this? Just when he needed encouragement. Just when he reached the point where, man, why does this keep happening? God comes along and encourages him and comforts him and keeps him from quitting. He made it clear that it was his will for Paul to stay there, keep working, and not to be afraid. This is very possibly one of the things that he alluded to in that first letter to, Cor to the Corinthian church, chapter 2, verse 3, when he said, I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. But it pleased God to meet with him, take away any doubt by assuring him he was going to succeed. Hey, nothing keeps you going like thinking you're going to win, you know? <laughs> He said, no man's going to hurt you. And he said this, I got a lot of people to save in Corinth. What was it Jesus said in Matthew 28, 20? He said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. God said, I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to protect you. Just like Jesus promised. Nobody's going to rise up against you. Nobody's going to be able to. That sounds like Isaiah 54, 17. He said, I possess. There belongs to me much people. In that city, so filled with self-gratification, so rich, where there was already decided so much opposition, God had a plan to still save many people. Amen. Paul was encouraged, keep working, 
God's going to give him success. See, God has a purpose. And it's the most important thing we're here for is to save people. God has a purpose to save sinners. He didn't come to save the good people. Well, there ain't no good people, but he did. He came to save the sinners. It is so fixed in the mind of God that there is no way, no doubt, in regard as to his willingness to save whosoever will. Amen. See, that, that's supposed to encourage those of us who teach and minister. That should be a, an encouragement. God has, if God doesn't have any intention of saving him, then we don't have any purpose to be. Come on. But his plan includes the most degraded in society. And none of us, none of us should be discouraged by the amount, by the degree of wickedness when we're trying to see people saved. You say, well, they're just too bad. I can't go, we can't go down there. We can't reach out to them. They're just too, they're too far gone. Is that what God said? See, there may be more hope for success among the degenerates than among the proud, the cold, and the skeptical. Paul had almost no success among the intellectuals in Athens, but he had great success among the deviants. There's often more hope of converting one person who is openly evil than one person who prides himself on his rational thinking and confidence in his own wisdom. So he stayed there a year and a half. And that was something because Paul didn't normally stay very long in any one place. Although later in Acts chapter 20, he stayed at Ephesus for three years. He stayed at Corinth because it was working. He stayed there because it was happening. And listen, you're not going to just hit and run in a place that was this wicked. You want to plant a church. You want to gather these people out of this corrupt and degenerate Caesarea. And you want to set them on a firm foundation. You'll notice that he did, they were still the things they had going on later on when he had to write to them and say, Hey, <laughs> what are you doing? You know, what is wrong with you? <laughs> and it says... After the Romans, see, they got all upset, and as, as usual. And here's this. Luke had a thing about switching names. And we need to follow that, because after the Romans conquered Greece, they split it into two provinces. They had Macedonia and Achaia. And Achaia was the place where Corinth was the capital. And so here they are. They raised the ruckus, as usual, just as they had in Philippi, just as they had in Antioch. They brought Paul to the judgment seat, realizing, knowing the Jews had no power to punish anybody in a Roman province. They had to bring him before the proconsul, the governor, whatever. And they said, to, look how people and it still happens, take advantage of their freedom. They were free to worship God any they wanted to, anywhere they wanted to by the Grecians. The Roman provinces at Greece let the Jews worship their way. Didn't care. Do what you want. But see how easy it is to pretend something different? They de pretended that Paul wasn't doing it right. It's easy to make a claim, church. It's easy to make an accusation. There's an old, old movie from way back yonder in which one of the lines that I always stuck in my head was say, when this little girl said, but it's easy to say you're a Christian. Yeah. You can claim anything. They claimed that Paul was violating the laws of the Romans, violating the Roman state religion. They were going to accuse him of teaching people to worship God in a way that nobody else did. And just about the time Paul's ready to open his mouth, <laughs> Gallio said, I don't care. <laughs> if this were a matter of something that could be properly brought before a court of justice, 
of such flagrant and gross offenses that it'd be different. And that word doesn't appear anywhere else in the New Testament. It, it means it's an act committed by someone who is a skilled veteran offender. He's willing to deal with all kinds of crimes. It doesn't matter what they are. It doesn't matter how good, how bad. But he said this, it's just a question of names and words. And isn't that what most of our disputes are about words? You didn't say that right. Well, welcome to my world. I hardly ever say it right. And there's usually some well-meaning person who will tell me I didn't say it right. But you know, it's easy to say. And Paul opened his mouth and he said, it's just about words that they're not going to pay attention to all your arguments about religion. Not going to do it. He said, I've heard about you people. All you do is make arguments over names, over whether this guy's a Messiah, this guy's not. He said, all you do is just dispute. And it's just you Jews. All you do is stir up trouble. You cause disputes. You got a difference over this group, this name. He says, there's so many things going on. He says, I don't have any time to spend on your nonsense. He says, you figure it out by yourselves. And he refused to hear them, and he ran them off. And so they took Sosthenes, who was probably leading that delegation, to accuse Paul. And when he got outside, the Greeks that were waiting out there said, you Jews don't start anything but trouble, so they pounced on him. And it says, the word here was, they beat him with their fists and whatever was at hand. It wasn't a whipping. They got on him, and they just pounded him. Could you get, don't people get aggravated? You know what's going to happen eventually? People are going to get aggravated with all this protest and riot nonsense, and somebody's going to fight back. And that's what they did here. They got tired of the Jews stirring things up everywhere they went, and the Greeks were waiting for him outside, and they jumped on him, beat him up, and I mean, they knew that the common practice of the Romans was to just look at the Jews with contempt anyway. Didn't care at all how they, what the public did to them. Didn't care how they were treated. And think about it, that may be our fate if the Lord tarries. People won't care what they do to the church. But anyway, Paul still stayed there a while. And then he took off again. Took Priscilla and Aquila with him cut his hair because whatever vow he had taken, and we don't know what it was, was over with. He couldn't cut his hair while he was under the vow. So the vow was over. Moses had so many regulations about vows. If you've ever gone back into Deuteronomy 23 and read some of that stuff, <clears throat> man could devote himself, his children, devote part of his time, part of his property. He had to do this or that. And then it could also ways they could hedge it and do it only partly. Yeah. But then he got to Ephesus. And left them there. Ephesus. If you go on your happy deluxe computer and Google Ephesus, it's a ruin. It's an archaeological ruin. It was a celebrated city. It was famous because it had one of the seven wonders of the world located there, the Temple of Diana. Now it's, that site is in Turkey, and it's a piece of rubble. There were a lot of Jews lived there. They had the privilege of citizenship. But Paul wasn't staying there this time. He left Aquila and Priscilla there, and they asked him to stay longer. He said he wasn't going to do it. He took off. He said, I've got to keep the feast that's coming in Jerusalem. Could be the Passover. Why? We're never told why it was so imperative that he go there and celebrate that particular feast. But he said, but I will return. And he did that in Acts 19, and he stayed there for three years. He landed at Caesarea, went up, visited the church in Antioch in Syria, spent some time there, went off again, went over all the country of Galatia and Phrygia in order, the country that he had been over all before, establishing churches, went back, checking on them, persuading, guiding, encouraging, and they call that his third missionary journey, okay? And now, 
Luke, for some reason, goes parenthetical. He jumps completely away from following Paul. He must have found a rabbit hole. <laughs> a certain Jew named Apollos, Greek name, born in Alexandria, one of the most famous cities in Egypt, founded by Alexander the Great. A lot of Jews living there, famous for its schools, probably was educated there, had natural talents to boot, mighty in the scriptures, well instructed. Foundation was laid for usefulness in the new Christian church. He already knew the scriptures. He became distinguished and successful as a preacher according to the 1 Corinthians 1 and 3 and Titus 3. And we don't know anything more about him than what's contained right here in these few scriptures. But he really made an impact. He, was in, he knew all about things. He knew the way. He was correctly taught in the scriptures. All of the Jews at this time, including Apollos, were expecting the Messiah. They had heard about John the Baptist. They had embraced his doctrine. They had been baptized. And he was baptizing in reference to the coming one. John was, if you remember that. But it's clear he hadn't heard the Messiah had come yet. He didn't know it was Jesus. But he was fervent in spirit. He taught diligently. He defended with zeal, with earnestness, the things that he knew as far as he knew them. But he only knew up to the baptism of John. He started speaking boldly in the synagogue. What is with these guys? <laughs> Don't they know? <laughs> They're not going to be well received. When Aquila and Priscilla heard him, they took him and explained to him a more full and complete instruction about the Messiah having already come and the nature of Jesus' work. So then he decides he wants to go to Greece. That's where his name came from. That's probably where his Countrymen were, so Ephesus wrote letters of recommendations and sent him off. He wanted to go there and tell them that Jesus of Nazareth matched all the predictions of all the prophets. Amen. And it says that many of the Greeks at Corinth were greatly delighted at his, at his eloquence, 1 Corinthians 1, 12 and 3, 4, and 5. And he, it was... but. If you read through that, you'll find out that his being there also caused some unhappy circumstances. So, But here's the thing out of this that we should see. He came there, and all of a sudden he had a following. But Paul had already been there, and he had a following. But how did Paul deal with that? He showed us how to deal with envy. In fact, he didn't have any. He just rose above it. And that the great success of another minister should not result in envy, neither should it alienate or cause any lack of confidence or goodwill towards that other person. Amen. Church, I don't understand, and since I got in this business, all I've seen, and well, not since I've been here, but up till I got here, it was all competition. Competition between ministers. Competition between churches. I always thought the only competition we had was with the devil. Yep. But Paul is teaching that even from there. He, Apollo strengthened them, helped them through their controversies, and saw how many were believing. And says he mightily convinced the Jews publicly, showing by the scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. Proving from the Old Testament. How often, how many of us can do that? Can we prove from the Old Testament that Jesus is the Messiah? Jesus is the Christ. Can we prove that? Oh, we, we can run all over the New Testament. I feel confident about that. But can we do that? Showing that Jesus corresponded with the account of the Messiah from every prophet. Jesus of Nazareth was not only the Messiah, but he's our Lord and our Savior. Amen. 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 Father, thank you again tonight for these that have come, for their patience, 
Father, for their ability to <sighs> tolerate. Father, I pray that somehow, somewhere, some way during this time, something has found fertile soil in some heart in this room. A Father, that it will bring forth fruit to your glory, multiplied 30, 60, 100 fold that you, Father, may gain glory, that there may be more and more people in these last days brought into the fold, into your church, saved by the power of the blood of Jesus. Now, Father, as we dismiss from this place, give each one of us traveling mercy, keep us under your blood, take us safely and uneventfully to our various destinations. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Share your love one another before you do anything else.